Thank you and welcome to Predicting Your Wellbeing Online. Today's session is going to be mostly about what to do in the event that you are the victim of online harassment or what is known as doxing. Um, so obviously doxing is when your private information, your private personal information is shared in an online forum and then you are then targeted um, by a group of people for kind of like cyber harassment and like other things. Um, so doxing can also be quite scary because often they also publish your home address, um, your phone number, a bunch of other things where people will start calling you, people will start trying to like find where you live and everything else. And so this session is kind of more about like how to respond to those types of attacks and then also to like, um, like what you can do to mitigate your risk of being a victim of one of those attacks. So again, today's session is about protecting yourself online. Um, so my name is Dr. Julia D. Cook. I'm an assistant professor in the School of Communication at Loyola University, Chicago. A conversation about digital privacy really can't kind of begin without defining kind of like different levels of what di digital privacy is. So we always hear about what digital privacy, um, its importance, um, you know, Europe just passed like these very intense laws about like GDPR and everything else, but what exactly is digital privacy? Well, digital privacy among scholars is kind of understood to have three levels. So there are um, three different levels of privacy. They are information, communication, and personal. So information privacy is the um, belief or the, um, or the kind of like a, metric that individuals should have the freedom or right to determine how their digital information is collected and used. Communication when it comes to privacy is about how individuals should have the freedom or right to communicate information digitally with, a, with the expectation that their communications are secure. So basically this is about um, the, the fact that you expect that whenever you like, you know, text a friend or like, you know, speak to a friend like privately in WhatsApp or like Facebook Messenger that like your um, communications are secure and that you're not being watched or that there's a risk that this information will be leaked to someone else. And then finally, uh, the personal level of digital privacy is that individuals have a right to exist freely on the internet and that they can choose what types of information they are exposed to. And more importantly, that unwanted information should not interrupt them. So this is kind of more about um, like the types of information that you're shown um, you know, we kind of expect on the internet that uh, we're not going to be shown things that are like troubling or distressing or violent and like that kind of thing, unless we're specifically seeking it out. However, this can also mean that um, there's this kind of like expectation that there's a personal level of privacy and that like your information isn't going to be shared unless you want it to. However, in the world that we live in, it's very easy to find information about people and to publish that about them. So visibility is crucial in today's environment, right? There's no way that someone can kind of exist, um, especially as an organization, without some kind of digital presence. There has to be some kind of digital presence. Even as an individual, you're expected to have a sort of digital presence. Um, and of course, these are th these things are useful, like having a high level of visibility and having a very strong digital presence is good because of the ability to reach a large amount of people, to build community, to network, and all these things, right? But because of the amount of information that you have to share within these settings, people can learn a lot about a lot of information about you that can threaten your emotional, physical, and mental well-being. Like I mentioned before, doxing isn't just about like the risk of you being harassed on Twitter, but can also result in people finding out where you live and like following you, finding out what your children look like and everything else, which has happened to people before. So obviously the risks include hacking, doxing, harassment, stalking, and more, but these kind of like cover the main bases that we're concerned about. So I was hoping um, we could actually do an activity um, so the activity that I kind of have planned for you all is mapping out your online presence. And so if you're able to, I want you to either find a, a sheet of paper or um, you can make your own kind of version of this digitally if you want, um, but a sheet of paper might be the easiest thing to do. So get a sheet of paper and make this graph. Um, and then I want you to kind of map out 
all of your online accounts on this graph. So institutional, personal, public, private is kind of what we're working with here. So for instance, um, I have a private Facebook page. And so Facebook for me would be somewhere over here. Right? You cannot find me on Facebook unless you have my email, pretty much. Um, so for me, Facebook is very private. However, Instagram doesn't really have that option. So Instagram would be probably somewhere over here for me. Um, and that it's more, more it's, it's more public than my Facebook, but it still is like fairly private. I'm going to put these down here because they're my personal accounts. But then there's something like Twitter that I almost exclusively use for um, like work purposes. And so Twitter, my Twitter is public, but I'm going to put it kind of over here, a little bit closer to institutional because of the fact that I use it more for work purposes, even though it is my personal account. And then something like this over here, let's, see, let's, let's leave that. Um, over here, I would put my work email. It's institutional. It's something that's been assigned to me by my work. It's pretty private, but you can find it online through directories and stuff like that. Um, and obviously, you know, my personal email. Put somewhere over here. Um, so these are just like some of the examples that you can use. So if you game, for instance, and you use like services like Steam, if you use services like Spotify, if you use YouTube frequently, um, even things like WhatsApp, like anything that you use that like is tied to any of your personal information to, for you to make an account, I want you to map onto this thing. Um, does anybody have any questions about this? Okay, if nobody has any questions, let's just take about 10 minutes to kind of like make your own graph. And if you have questions about if something that you have like falls into this graph or where it would fall, um, you can either use the chat or um, ask to show your mic and I'd be happy to answer your question. Um, yeah, if you're just joining us, we're doing this kind of like little online activity. Um, so we're doing this for about, about six more minutes. You're mapping out your digital presence. So any account that you use that's tied to any of your personal information, I want you to kind of map onto here um, wherever you think something falls. So, you know, something that's more personal, something that's more institutional, which is kind of like work or university related. And then whether something is public or private, I want you to kind of map where these kinds of accounts fall. Um, uh, we, we only have about four or five minutes to keep doing this activity. But if you want to just do it, you can. Um, I'm hoping that somebody shares their graph once we're kind of done with time. If you shop online a lot or use like specific services to shop online, would encourage you to put that on there. Um, so for example, if you use Amazon a lot, um, technically a lot of your Amazon stuff is public if you make reviews and stuff like that. So that definitely counts as somewhere in between, you know, in between like public and private, but personal. Uh, so if you shop online a lot, you know, you can also include some of those accounts on this graph as well, because all of that is tied to very personal information about you. Okay, so we've got about a minute left. So as you can see, I've kind of sort of like been adding things to my own graph just to give you an idea of what this looks like. Um, of course, this isn't, this isn't exhausted. I've been, I've been putting together something for you all too um, at the end of this, for the end of this, workshop, but you can kind of see already that there's a lot of accounts on here. Um, even though this isn't an exhaustive list of everything that I use. Oh, Netflix needs to be on here somewhere too. Um, Netflix, um, other streaming services, um, all of these things uh, count for. So obviously a lot of people are going to have a lot of stuff kind of in this corner, kind of like personal private more than anything else. Um, so don't feel bad if you have a lot of stuff in this corner because that just tends to be kind of the norm. Okay, so we're at time. So it's been about 10 minutes. Would anyone be willing to share their own graph um, and kind of reflect on like 
how many accounts that you have, if you're surprised, like seeing it all kind of mapped out. Um, for a lot of people, this activity is the first time that like anybody has ever really taken stock of how many things that they have online that is tied to their personal information. Um, does anyone want to share? Does, does anyone want to share how this activity made them think about their digital presence or like, is anybody really surprised at how many things there are? Um, has anybody ever done this type of activity before? All right, so I'll, I will go. Um, I know that, uh, yeah, I, Maria, I'm, I'm the same. Uh, I, I grew up with, a, admittedly, I have thought about this. Uh, I grew up with a mother who works at, uh, for uh, Equifax, the company that ended up getting hacked, a uh, credit company. So I think being mindful of, of my, my presence in many instances, um, whether it's my credit card information or whatever the case may be is one thing, but I think obviously, uh, maybe not obviously, but in the US we have an entirely different level of what is made available because of what is public knowledge and what's public information. So if you Google my name, you can find out my addresses, for instance, the places that I've lived, like you don't even need to do much digging. Like if you literally Google Aaron Mizak, you can find uh, my previous address in San Diego. So uh, I think, Obviously, there's that level of awareness, but I think now bringing it to like, for instance, Amazon, Netflix, uh, like streaming uh, personal services, shopping services, um, but then also thinking of, of uh, like social media and whatnot, I think, I think I would suggest that I'm not so visible from a social media perspective, um, but also presumably more than, than others. So I think this is, this is a great exercise, I think, especially when we think about um, especially a lot of us that are that are working with uh, younger generations because maybe people don't take into consideration um, how much this will affect them i think obviously having information about me as a person where i live etc cetera, etc cetera, is one thing but i think especially whenever we talk to like what is the future generation going to get themselves into from the perspective of uh, like what will exist online from when they're children to as to as to when they're adults so like our generation will now have people that are so i'm 31 so we'll have people now that are, are becoming into positions of power and relevant and significant positions and that their, their digital footprint will remain and potentially end up being something that's detrimental to their, to their professional career. But I think, again, as we're talking about cybersecurity and digital security, that's even more relevant. So uh, anyways, that, that was my bit. No, yeah, thank you. And I think you bring up a really uh, important point about the digital footprint, right? Because like all of these accounts that people have, like it's tied to extremely personal information, like everything from your home address to your credit card information, to your full name, to your birth date. Um, and like some of these services like even required like social security numbers sometimes, like banking apps and stuff like that. And so it's like, if anybody got a hold of this information, like they could do a lot of things with it. And mm -hmm. so everything from, you know, obviously like stealing your identity to like getting the information they need to dox you. Um, so it's kind of the point of this exercise is that I think to get people to really take stock of like how present they are online, even if the accounts are private because things are only as private as like you think that they are. Mm -hmm. Someone really get your information, it's very easy to. So um, a, a, a question that I would have, and maybe you'll build on this is how, in how many instances can we share, do you encourage people to share fictitious information, just false information? So maybe I don't actually live at address X, Y, Z, Rather, that's where that's like my go to. This is where I live. But now you run the risk of having my mail go to someone else's house. So now I'm running a different risk of of that information being sent to someone else. So I'm curious as to what, what if you'll elaborate on that further or how to reduce this. So when it comes to like mail stuff, like uh, the recommendation in the US is that if you're someone who is like at risk of being targeted is to get a P.O. box. Sure um because then it's not tied to your like physical home um but you know obviously that creates like more issues but i personally know people who have had to do that mm -hmm. um because they just kept getting harassed and their home address kept getting published online um but then also too like there's also recommendations which i'll go over in a little bit that like you know they encourage people to use like fake birthdays and stuff like that um 
because it's like it's those pieces of information that are really valuable right because right. that's what makes you like a unique person and so um you know i hope people got something out of this activity i always love doing this with like students or like other people because it's the first time a lot of people have ever like really seen like visually like how many accounts that they have even mm -hmm. if it's not like all the accounts they have and it's usually pretty surprising because you know i did it um this isn't all the accounts i have but this is still quite a lot mm -hmm. um and so you know thank you all for participating and thank you aaron for jumping in and sharing um thank you yeah and you know let's move on with like the rest of the presentation so what can you do if you're targeted right um people always ask like aren't there laws to protect me um in most places in the world especially the us but um like e even across like the eu and other um, countries and stuff like that there is little to no legal protection for online harassment stalking and like other kinds of risks associated with having an online presence um for instance privacy laws in the united states largely benefit corporations and not individual users um you generate a large source of revenue through your digital footprint and this data is extremely valuable um, of course laws vary from country to country but the problem that people tend to see um, coming up over and over again is that many police and legislation often don't know how to address crimes of this nature so even if like there are laws in place in your country to protect against these issues if you go to the police like a lot of them don't get training on what to do in these kinds of situations and so it's often not you know super helpful but the police also won't be helpful for another reason if you work for an organization that is often targeted by your government for its political views the police may actually keep information about you your friends colleagues etc on file and may use this information against you or people that know you one day depending on the situation in your country when it comes to your government and your political um, landscape. And even if they do want to help, most police don't have dedicated cybercrime experts or staff. And similarly, like stalking laws often don't cover online harassment. For instance, in the United States, and I'm not sure if this is the same in wherever you are, but stalking laws, like they basically can't do anything. They can't arrest anyone until they like physically harm you effectively. Um, and that's a huge, huge, huge oversight. And so one thing that I would like to point out is that cybercrime and harassment and like stalking and doxing and all these things overwhelmingly target girls and women. Um, so like a lot of the resources that you'll find like will be targeted towards like girls and women because they are the ones who are overwhelmingly targeted. And so, you know, we, uh, we have to ask, like, how do you protect yourself? You know, any amount of online presence puts you at risk. Um, you know, in the chat, Diana mentioned, you know, it is always surprising how much we share about yourself, uh, but unfortunately you also have to be visible for your jobs. And so there are ways to mitigate this risk, right? So first step, always check your privacy settings on social media. For all of your personal accounts, if you haven't done so already, set your settings to private and require uh, the thing to approve followers where it'll say like someone has asked to follow you and you have to accept or deny. If you cannot do this for whatever reason, you know, regularly go through your followers list and remove and block anybody or anything that seems suspicious. Um, so I do this pretty regularly with my Twitter account because it is more public, even if it is for work. Um, and so I regularly go through my Twitter followers list and I remove and block people um, that they seem suspicious, that they seem like they are bots um, and everything else. If you can't do this, be extremely selective about what information you share online. Have multiple accounts for personal and public use if needed. But most importantly, regardless of the nature of your account, if it's you know personal, if it's for work, whatever, never share your location you know, that was really popular and it still is for a very long time to share your location, to tag yourself where you were. Never do that. Do not ever feature your friends or family if you can help it. Um, 
Even try to avoid featuring pets, especially if you have a dog that you walk regularly outside. Um, and do not share pictures of your home. Never share a picture of your home from the outside because that is very easily like searchable and like it can be found um, through things like Google Maps and other things. Or like, you know, um, homes and apartments tend to have numbers on them. And so like if someone has that information, they can very easily find where you live. Um, Second steps, if you are like me and you have to spend a lot of time in kind of like CD online spaces, definitely recommend that you um, use a VPN. So VPN is a virtual private network. It encrypts your actual IP address with a random one. So your IP address is the physical location of your computer. One thing that I have to tell people that cybersecurity experts also recommend is that if a VPN is free, it is not safe. Um, so basically these are just some suggestions of like VPNs that you can um, use tunnel bear, cyber ghost, Viper VPN, pure VPN, all of them are paid. Um, they're all pretty cheap and there are a lot more out there. Um, but basically the best way to gauge like what the best VPN is, is one that A works for you and B isn't free. Um, if you want to be extra vigilant, a lot of these services also offer VPNs for your phone, um, especially if you're someone who spends a lot of time within these like, kind of like online spaces or someone who is kind of at risk of being targeted. You can also use a VPN for your phone and tablet if you so choose. So first step, lock down your social media. Second step, invest in a VPN. Um, and then third step, always audit yourself. And so real quick, I just want you all to go into incognito mode or private browsing and to Google yourself. Let's give you all kind of a minute to do that. And it's important to do this in incognito or private browsing, because then it's not like thinking it's you Googling for yourself. It kind of mimics or mirrors the, the results if like anybody was Googling you if that makes sense. Does anyone want to kind of share what they found by Googling themselves? Okay, you found your Facebook page. So if you're if you're in incognito mode and you Googled yourself, you immediately found your Facebook page. Yeah, that's a little bit concerning, right? That like your Facebook page is one of the first things that pop up, especially if you're like looking to get information on somebody. Um, there is an option in Facebook to remove yourself from online search results. And I recommend that you all go into your settings and make sure that that's toggled, um, especially if you're someone who's at risk of being targeted. Um, so another uh, recommendation that people often say is to um, not just like Google yourself in incognito mode, but also you can use DuckDuckGo, which is an anonymous search engine. Um, so it never like collects information about you or like what you're searching for. So it doesn't um, manipulate your results based on that. Google does. Um, and so that's always a really good resource to use in case you're wondering what kinds of information are being shown about you to people who are just trying to Google you. Um, like Aaron mentioned, I don't know if everyone was here when he talked about this, but in the US in particular, um, there's a huge issue where there's basically no laws preventing this. And so people's like private information is posted on websites like white pages, like home addresses, and even like the addresses of your parents and like phone numbers, like all of this stuff is just openly out there. And so in the US, for instance, there's like services that will go through and delete this information um, for you. So privacy duck is one, delete me is another. Um, if there are services in like your home country um, that claim to erase you from the dark web, like this is false, like don't ever pay more for it. Um, and then Aaron mentioned that purchasing a home is public knowledge in the US as well, if I'm not mistaken, yes. So if you purchase a home in the United States, like anybody can get that information about you, um, either online or by going to like the like city hall where the home was purchased all that knowledge is all that information is public knowledge um yeah diana said i usually make sure to have control on what shows up about myself but i discovered now an article on a weird website which takes one of my posts yeah so this is going to be a persistent issue which is why it's super important to uh, regularly audit yourself 
like at least once a quarter, if not like once a month, especially if you're someone who's highly visible. Um, if you live in a country that posts like public knowledge or like public information um, in terms of like buying homes or everything else, there is a link there on how to do it for yourself. Um, if I'm not mistaken, this is more of an issue in the US than other countries. And so this may or may not be super relevant to you, but it, the, the, the crux of the issue is, is that like, there's always going to be like private information about you that someone can find very easily through just a simple Google search. And so always, always, always make sure that you're auditing yourself. Even if you have to ask like your friends or like, um, like colleagues and stuff to Google you to get an idea of what someone sees when they Google you, um, that's always a really good approach to do as well. Fourth step. So turn on two-factor authentication on all of your online accounts if you haven't yet. Especially do this for things like email and social media. Um, a lot of people use the same username and password for everything. Um, is there anyone here who tends to use the same username and password for everything? It's okay to admit it. A lot of people do because it's a lot easier to remember. Um, but you know, that's, that's extremely, extremely dangerous because if you use the same username for one account, people can just search your username and then like find a ton of things about you. If you use the same password for a lot of things, they will try that password on every single one of your accounts. And so even though it's a lot easier to remember, it puts you at so much more risk. And so, I recommend that you start using different usernames and passwords, at least use different passwords for your accounts. Um, you can start using a password manager to keep track of all of these passwords that you have to create. Um, so some, some examples include like Dashlane, um, Avine Blur, Keeper, LastPass, um, OnePass is another one. Um, and actually, this is actually very surprising information to people, but randomly generated passwords of letters and numbers. So the example that I kind of give there, right? Like the UX, whatever, whatever, are actually less secure than passwords that are strings of phrases with numbers in them. So as you can see, this says like cake, pie, and pastry with like numbers and like different capitalizations. So the reason for this is because password generators will eventually guess this if someone's trying to get into your account, right? But strings of phrases are a little bit easier for you to remember, um, as well as, you know, harder to guess, right? Um, Diana makes the point that uh, OnePass offers free accounts for NGOs, um, which is really useful. But if you're looking for a personal account, um, all of these are really great options. And OnePass is really great for your organization. All right, so additional steps are things that you may not know about. Um, if you have a personal website domain, this information may be public. Ask to have it take it down um, through your web hoster. Regularly do security audits through Google and DuckDuckGo to see what information is out there about you. Like I mentioned, like try to do it at least quarterly, if not once a month. Um, you can also turn on Google alerts um, if you have a Google account, you can turn on Google alerts to like tell you when your name comes up somewhere. Um, I do this, it's pretty helpful. Um, another important thing to do is to regularly clear your browser history um, because you don't want people to know like what you're doing online, especially if you're being followed or stalked. Um, regularly run malware and spyware scans on your devices. Um, Malwarebytes is a really good free service. Um, and then one thing to uh, reiterate to people is to always, always, always update your phone and your computer. They contain crucial security updates, especially for iPhone and Mac users. So I know a lot of people who are very resistant to updating their iPhones um, and their Macs, um, but always, always, always update because the security updates in them um, are to protect you. All right, so what do you do in the midst of harassment? If you are actively being harassed online, turn notifications off on your phone and take your accounts down temporarily if you need to. Reach out and ask for help from your institution, like your, if you're a university student, ask for help from your university, from your organization and from experts. Um, 
and alert your friends, families, and colleagues privately that you are being harassed and doxxed. Utilize things like block lists, especially on Twitter. There are a number of services now that will like block like large groups of people for you instead of you having to manually do it yourself, um, which is really, really helpful. Uh, they're everything from kind of like, you know, browser extensions to like Twitter, uh, Twitter apps and everything else. Um, but definitely, def definitely take advantage of this kind of service. Um, harassment, stalking, doxing, and other forms of digital violence are extremely traumatic. Um, seek counseling and therapy to talk through this trauma if you need to. Change your passwords regularly. Absolutely protect your Wi-Fi password and also make sure that your Wi-Fi network is protected in the first place. Um, and to really, really, really be vigilant, use only encrypted messaging services, especially on your phone. iMessage, uh, WhatsApp, and Signal are all very good options. Um, Facebook Messenger, Instagram DMs, and other modes of communicating are not encrypted. And so they are not as secure, and it means that anybody can gain access to your private communications. All right, what else can you do? Have a security plan. Um, if you're someone whose private information was posted online, including your address um, or even your work address, which happens to a lot of people, you can set up webcams in your home and cheap alarms on your doors and windows if you can't afford like a full security system. Um, you know, advocate for these protections at your workplace if you do work that puts you at risk. Um, go through and delete old accounts. This is something that a lot of people tend to overlook. So, you know, with how many different like social media platforms that have happened or like old emails or like even like online stores you no longer shop at, like delete these accounts. Um, uh, one place that you can go to is this website here, um, name, chk, namecheck.com to see like what um, accounts are associated with a certain email if you can't remember everything. Um, if you're actively being doxxed or harassed and nothing is stopping it, just delete everything. Delete pictures of yourself, your pets, your family, your car, your mailbox, all of your accounts. Um, it seems extreme, but it is the one thing that will truly work. Um, we had this conversation before when Aaron kind of popped in. Um, there are some recommendations, especially on social media accounts to make your birthday, your hometown, where you live, like make them all fake or don't provide them at all. And the reason why in one of the previous slides, I said to alert your friends and family and colleagues privately that you're being doxxed is that if you publicly announce it, this sends a signal to whoever is harassing you that your information is accurate. Never publicly confirm or deny information. Is that kind of surprising to anybody? But when you think about it, it makes a lot of sense, right? Um, also, my, my cat has joined us. <laughs> All right, so here's a list of additional resources. I actually also um, put them together for you in a, let's see, in a Google Doc, um, if you'd like to see it. So I will share this with you all in the chat. Um, this is a list of resources, um, including some that are EU specific, if that's helpful for anyone, um, on kind of what to do if you're actively being doxxed or harassed or like additional steps that you can take. Um, I could share the slides with you if that would be helpful for everyone. Um, but that's the presentation. I hope you all learned a lot. If you have any more questions, you can reach out to me at my email, which is listed here, um, or you can follow me on Twitter. Um, so I'll open it up for questions now. Hello again. Um, I have a question. So uh, in our project, of course, we um, we more or less guide young people to create uh, social uh, youth-led social media campaigns. So in these instances where we're encouraging young people to create uh, a social media campaign, what would you recommend from the perspective of like how to have them create their own accounts? So do they create an account which has no affiliation to them, rather just the local community because they would be drawing off of those IPs as well as maybe uh, identifying the address, not their exact address, but the location that they're in. So let's say they're developing a campaign for 
at Warsaw, Poland. They would create an account. They would not have it linked to theirs at all. Um, presumably use like incognito mode or whatever the case may be. Because this is a question that came up um, when we were creating campaigns because we had um, some of our project partners. Uh, understandably so, we're concerned because they're, they're creating counter speech uh, on the topics of racism, uh, LGBTQ ideology, et cetera, et cetera. So I think we just want to make sure that we're support, uh, sorry, we're, we're cautious um, in, in how we support uh, these youth led campaigns. No, definitely. And so like the recommendation to like have it be completely separate is like the safest thing to do because it's very tempting when you have to start a new account to just like add an account to your already logged in like Instagram, for instance, mm -hmm. right? But if someone gains access to that, like, you know, um, a, a healthier Warsaw campaign, whatever, and like, then they can also gain access to all of your private accounts because all of them are linked. And so mm -hmm. just having them completely separate, like might be like a little bit more of a pain to like toggle between them, but it's mm -hmm. significantly safer, right? right? Um, and so that's the like the best recommendation is to keep these things completely separate. Um, if you have to make like a page for your organization or whatever, like avoid using like anybody's like real name or like real birthday, like any of these things, right? Um, okay. Those are kind of the recommendations. It like, you have to put in a birthday. So like just put in something like, you know, January 1st, like 1990, like that can be like anybody, right? Um, sure. So like mm -hmm. those are kind of the things that you can do. Um, you know, obviously when it comes to posting like, because obviously like live streaming and like all these things are very, very crucial, like parts of having like an online presence. Um, and if you are actively doing that, like make sure that once the stream is done that you leave the location. Sure. Um, because that's a huge issue too, is that like, you know, um, like, you know, it was like the, remember like Foursquare and like all these kinds of like, mm -hmm. like social media where like it encouraged you to like check yourself in places and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, even on Facebook and Twitter, like people can like tag themselves where they physically are and stuff like that, right? Um, if you have to do that, like tag yourself like where you are, like make those posts after you've left the location and stuff like that. Because I think that's a really important tip for young people, especially because like for them, it's that whole idea of like, um, like letting people know where they are, like broadcasting themselves and stuff like that. Um, and so like, keeping accounts separate, like never posting like actual physical location, like all of these things are really important for youth, especially. Does anybody else have any other questions? All right, I suppose I have one more then. So <laughs> do, do you suggest, for example, for, for instance, let's say I have an Amazon account, I have a whatever, Netflix account, et cetera, et cetera. Do you suggest creating an email that um, would not necessarily trace back to you. So for instance, it's an email that has a bunch of artificial information. So that way, at least when I sign up for these platforms, it's linked to an email that has, the only association it has with me is that it's connected to my IP address and I guess my credit card. But like, it doesn't have my name, it doesn't have my birthday, it doesn't have these other things. Yeah, if you wanna be extra vigilant, then yeah, definitely. Um, okay. But like, you know, that tends to be like, something that I've seen people who have already been docs kind of doing, or uh, they never like, for instance, like, you know, you can like pay for things via P uh, PayPal on a lot of stuff sure. um, without having to provide your credit card information and billing address and everything. Like, mm -hmm. you know, if you want to be extra, extra vigilant, like, you know, have an email account for signing up for these types of services, pay for everything using PayPal, like, mm -hmm. and all these things. Um, I think the average person usually doesn't have to do that, but if you're actively working on a campaign with for like counter narratives sure. and like everything else, it's good to be, it's like, you know, what is it? An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure or whatever, you know, um, sure. the same thing kind of applies here. Yeah, and, and I ask because this is too much information for the audience, but every time I sign up for something, I'm like, ah, if, like, if I'm signing up for something that I, like a coupon service of some sort it's like all right i shouldn't actually put my real information i should have like a spam email account because i think we often think of it from the perspective of like i don't want the spam but the more spam you have the more that you have your name out there right. presumably if you're actually providing uh, like this information so if you're able to just pr create like an alias of sorts then presumably it, there's less of your information out there so right yeah. right and yeah i think that also goes back to like you know we sign up for all these like, you know, clothing websites or like whatever else that they sell and might not ever purchase from them again. 
but these websites mm -hmm. all have our information. And so like definitely going through and like deleting old accounts is like super crucial. Yeah, while you were speaking, I used name check and I was like, I don't think that I, I've never used this service before. Like how is how is my email there? So this is <laughs> now right. an interesting, an interesting uh, development, unless I just did it when I was 18 and don't remember, which is probably the case, so. Right, or like you bought something from a website once, like 10 years right. ago, but yeah. all that information is still on file, so. Yeah, really, really good to know. And I think, uh, again, especially with uh, with all of us that are working with young people, this is super relevant to share with those young people because mm -hmm. as I'm mentioning something that I did when I was 18, obviously um, it's really helpful to, um, to to share that with them and say, hey, and, and kind of guide them down the right path. So when they're old enough and they have uh, credits, credit card information and they have their personal information out there, that's like prime for people to steal that information. and open up credit cards and all these other things, so yeah. Oh, absolutely, especially because like we do so many things without thinking about them too right. online. So I think these are all like really crucial points to make. Um, and especially when it comes to young people, like the people who are most at risk are young girls and young women. Exactly, yeah. Um, so I think like for them especially, like it's more crucial. Like when I was looking for resources uh, to share with everyone, like all of the, um, like European Union or like European focused resources, like specifically talked about women and girls more than anything else, because it's mm -hmm. overwhelmingly something that is an issue um, for them as opposed to like young boys and men. Yeah. Um, and so I think that's also something that we have to kind of like pay attention to as well. Yeah, exactly. Obviously my concerns as a, as a, a white male are significantly different than the concerns of that of uh, a woman of any, any, um, yeah, any ethnicity, I suppose. But uh, yeah, I actually, I, I, it's very relevant. There's there's a video somewhere. I can't remember exactly what it is. This isn't helpful, but uh, if I find it, I'll send it to, to everybody here. Um, but it's actually someone that goes and finds a woman just based on her social media presence and literally just says like, this all this information that you're sharing, like I just found you, like more or less finding them just to prove a point and say like, if I'm a random person that's interested in harming you in any way, shape or form, like, it's very simple for me to do, so be mindful of that. So um, anyways, yeah, I, I think it's 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 incredible. It's incredibly easy, as you mentioned, um, especially with the amount of information that people share on social media. So again, for the young people that, uh, that everybody's working with, it's, it's, uh, this is awesome information. Yeah, so yeah, and I, and I hope that the resources are helpful for everyone. I shared the slides too, if those are helpful. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, and, and we, we have this recorded and we'll definitely be sharing this. Uh, I think we, again, got to end of the day lull because uh, this is this is day number three. So we have a lot of, um, yeah, we have a lot of people that have kind of petered out. So this will be made available on our on our resources page. So I think this is something that we'll definitely be pushing to organizations because, uh, again, this is this is very relevant, especially for the work that, that we're doing.